Thank you, Dave. Um, next, we're going to hear, hear our keynote presenter, uh, which is Eric Asadorian. Uh, Eric joins us from the World Watch Institute. Uh, Eric is a senior fellow at the Institute where he has studied cultural change, consumerism, degrowth, ecological ethics, corporate responsibility, religion, and sustainability, sustainable communities over the last 11 years. Uh, in 2012, Eric co-directed State of the World 2012, Moving Towards Sustainable Prosperity, and he wrote the, pre the Path to Degrowth in Overdeveloped Countries for the report. He's now co-directing State of the World 2013, Is Sustainability Still Possible? And joining us today is Eric Asnorian um, to talk to us about the recent book uh, that the World Watch Institute has released uh, worldwide. Thank you, Deb, and Dave, and Irene, and John, and everyone at ISDC for all your help in getting me here today. Uh, and especially thanks to all of you for inviting me here to share some of our work at World Watch and, and for being sustainability leaders who deserve to be in the room. So I'm very excited to have that opportunity to talk with you all. Uh, as Deb noted, I've been at World Watch for many years, 12 actually, uh, directing State of the World, uh, our other report, Vital Signs, which looks at some of the key sustainability trends. And what's striking in that time is pretty much all the trends just keep going up. Population growth, economic growth, carbon emissions, uh, energy use of, of all different types, solar, wind, uh, well, nuclear is the exception perhaps, but uh, fossil fuels especially, deforestation, even the word, the use of the word sustainability uh, is, gro is going up every year. It's a simple cartoon, not a scientific study, but as it points to that over the next century, we're looking at a future where the only word in the English language is the term sustainability over and over and over again. Uh, now, obviously, this is not a peer-reviewed study, uh, but it points to a bigger trend that we see and had to really raise with this year's State of the World, which is the growing use of and growing spread of sustainable. Uh, we're really, we really need to recognize that as the sustainability crisis is growing, we're talking about sustainability more, but we're not fully understanding what true sustainability really means. So this year, we decided to focus State of the World on looking at three key questions to move this conversation forward. First of all, what is sustainability and how do we measure it? Uh, second, once we have that understanding of sustainability, how do we get to true sustainability? Not just more conversations and international meetings that lead to no actual movement forward, no action. Uh, this is an image cartoon of the Rio Plus 20 Summit uh, that unfortunately didn't lead to much. But really getting into how do we move towards a truly sustainable future, changing, uh, you know, making green buildings, shifting corporate structures, uh, re-engineering cultures to normalize sustainability and so on and so on. Uh, and, and the third section we included this year, and this is something new for World Watch, uh, an organization that you know, has been looking at environmental issues for uh, 40 years, uh, and you know, part of that early set of environmental organizations often called the doom and gloom environmentalists, you know, we, we don't usually talk about that doom and gloom future, but we felt like it was very important to, to have an honest conversation about what happens if we don't get to a sustainable society. Uh, and we've had 40 years now since the, the books like Limits to Growth, a Blueprint for Survival, have come out and made it clear that uh, we had a, a window of 40 years to, to get towards sustainability, and we haven't used it. So let's start talking honestly about what is this ecological transition that might be coming going to look like, and how do we make ourselves more resilient if it does come? So I want to just give some highlights from, from each of the, the sections, but especially really applied to the, to the messaging of you know, what does that mean for the business and government communities that we have here in the room. 
Uh, and so really in the first section there are articles on, on fresh water use and what's sustainable rates that entails oceans and fisheries, uh, the planetary boundaries if you're familiar with that concept. But one of my favorite chapters is actually uh, by uh, Bill Reese and his colleague Jenny Moore who uh, Bill Reese co-founded the ecological footprint analysis. And they actually look at and envision what a one planet way of life would look like. And this, this image up here is comparing a three planet lifestyle with a one planet lifestyle. For those of you not familiar with ecological footprint, it looks at how many Earths we would need to sustain people at different consumption levels, uh, essentially. And if we all, if you might have heard this statistic, if we all consumed like Americans, we'd need four planets. Uh, this, this image right here, this is a three planet. This is a European lifestyle, not even to the American lifestyle. But to, to be, if we're honest with where, how far we need to go to get to a sustainable society, we're talking about significant reductions in, in calories, which will clearly have a good side benefit for a country that's overweight, uh, two-thirds of us are overweight or obese, reducing in, in meat consumption and living space. Uh, cars is one of my favorite examples here where we actually need to go from one car per two people to 0.004 cars per person. That's, that's the sustainable level that we're talking about. That's the level of change that we're talking about. And what does that mean? In, in, a, in a city like where I'm from, Washington, D.C., with uh, 620,000 people, we're talking about a car population of 2,500. So if you actually distribute those strategically, emergency vehicles, police cars, delivery trucks, buses, uh, and so on, we don't have many left for private car ownership. Maybe the president gets a car, uh, probably not any of the congressmen or senators. Uh, but that might put them down, back down to earth, so that, that might not be a bad thing. Uh, but so really, we're talking about a huge difference in, in, in what we think about when we're talking about real sustainability and what we often talk about as slightly less bad, slightly greener. So that's another way to envision this kind of, we're really talking about reductions in flying and, 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 and home sizes, cars, local diets. And even, even the pets are, have to be on the table, if we're honest, with, uh, with the, where we're heading towards. So I, I, I recognize this is not a very um, popular policy recommendation. Uh, I'm, essentially, I'm talking about degrowth, intentionally degrowing our economies and our societies toward, to get back within the limits of Earth's systems. Not a, pol a, po a popular idea in a room full of business and government leaders. I recognize that. Uh, but I think it's essential to start talking openly about it because of, of the false choices that we often consider. You know, it's not about whether we choose degrowth or continue to choose growth or slightly greener growth. It's about whether we choose to prepare intentionally and move intentionally towards contracting our economies or allowing the Earth to do that for us. And the Earth will not be as gentle in its transition or its timing as, as we could be. And let me just give a little bit more context on this just to kind of catch your attention a little bit more. But you know, the, the World Bank just a few years ago and released another one last year, uh, a, a look at the four degree world and, and why we need to, to avoid it. And just mapping out what a four degree future is looking, uh, would look like. And, 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 and that's the direction that we're heading towards. Four degree is, is most likely at this point, unless we make some major changes. Even the IEA, the International Energy Agency, noted uh, this past year that if we actually want to stay within two degrees of climate change, an increase of only two degrees Celsius, uh, we're going to have to keep two thirds of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground, not extract them by 2050. And that's actually just for a 50-50 chance at keeping it within two degrees. Uh, the, to increase our probability, we're actually talking about about 80% of fossil fuels need to stay in the ground. So that's a radical change from, from where we're heading. But in order to stabilize that climate, in order to stay at 400 parts per million, or ideally even get back to the 350 parts per million threshold that seems to suggest some climate stability in the future, we're going to have to make major changes. And if not, we're going to have to instead get ourselves ready 
for an increasingly unstable economic and political world. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, the, the, the image of Katrina, uh, just one older example of, of where we're heading. But I, I want to kind of give a few examples of how disruptive this, this unstable climate could be. Uh, of course, it, it, this Katrina caused over $100 billion in, in economic damage. It led to massive uh, destruction of government infrastructure, like this uh, court in, in Mobile, Alabama, like this uh, McDonald's franchise on the Gulf Coast. There are more recent, of course, the Hurricane Sandy, but there's also other changes that, that because of our design of a global economy, are having major impacts. This is a picture of flooding in Thailand back in 2011, which had ramifications on global supply chains in the computer industry, in the uh, car industry, and flooded 900 factories in Thailand. Uh, we can say the same thing about uh, in 2010, there were uh, massive uh, heat waves that affected the EU, uh, Canada, and Russia. R Russia to the extent where it actually created massive uh, wildfires and led them to ban export of grain, which uh, almost doubled prices of grain in the short term and uh, many argue were a major driver in the Arab Spring. So we're talking about major changes in political stability uh, being triggered by this, this kind of climate instability. And if you know, this, this, you can't probably, maybe in the front you can't see this lower uh, key on the bottom, but this, this is about a four degree increase Celsius in these heat wave affected and drought affected areas, which again, going back to the World Bank report, this might be the norm. So we could expect a future where drought and commodity prices end up skyrocketing uh, regularly. So I'm not here to kind of scare you about the future as much as I am to kind of start mapping out our two pathways and let you choose which one seems more attractive. Uh, you know, really we're talking about do we get ready for this? How do we insulate ourselves from this growing instability? And I, I want to walk through just a few interesting examples from the report, from, from uh, recent news of kind of getting ready for what many call the long emergency or the ecological transition or, or in Jared Diamond's overly maybe exaggerated terms, the collapse. <laughs> uh, but you know, in the extreme example is uh, the Nordic countries are actually creating a Noah's Ark, essentially, for seed biodiversity uh, from around the world. Uh, this is uh, on Svalbard Island. Uh, they've actually taken seeds from, uh, from the major crops of the world uh, and, and stored them in a, in a cold vault uh, above the Arctic Circle that should be uh, able to be sustained even in the worst climate change scenarios. Although I, I find this example especially interesting because on Svalbard Island, even today, there are still fossils of subtropical plants because long ago, many, many, many millions of years ago, uh, the climate was much, much warmer and there actually were subtropical plants in the Arctic Circle. So, so this is the scale. It also kind of hints to the potential futures if we're not careful. Uh, a, a, a less apocalyptic sounding and, and more just strategic thinking uh, structured example is actually that of Netherlands, which is actually cr has created a 200 year plan to prepare its country for one meter of sea level rise. Now this is especially important in the Netherlands because 50% of their people live under one meter of, of elevation. Uh, they've done some really bold things. They've committed over a billion dollars a year in preparing. Uh, they've actually um, worked, taken a very active role for our government in changing economic structures uh, you know, literally dismantling certain businesses like a, a hotel on the coast, that, that coastline area needed to be made into dike area to protect the, the inner uh, lands. So they actually you know, basically uh, converted that hotel company into a fishing company and gave them a new, uh, a new economic direction. Uh, not, not something that would go over very well in this culture, but interesting in its own way. And uh, one other example is m more close to home, that of Chicago, which is actually 
working to prepare itself for the climate of Baton Rouge. Uh, it's basically, if you look at the, the climate projections, Chicago is going to have the climate of, a, of the deep south uh, by 2100, uh, unless, unless we make some major, major changes in between. So they're already starting to adjust their city planning. They've made the, the asphalt more permeable so that uh, flooding can actually be absorbed uh, by the streets. They've made green roofs. Uh, they're actually even changing street trees that they're planting from northern species to species like the swamp oak and the sweet gum tree, which uh, do, do much better in, in warmer temperatures. Unfortunately, they're also doing things that are a little bit more absurd, like uh, considering adding air conditioning to the 750 public schools uh, they have, which uh, ironically would, would exacerbate the problems, not, not make them better. But you know, even the fact that, that Chicago is thinking that far ahead is, is a real step in the right direction. Uh, and, and there are other examples uh, David Orr talks about in the, in the report, uh, looking at, at uh, other ways to strengthen government uh, Michael, uh, right now, in order to protect, uh, uh, help strengthen governance in the long emergency. And Michael Renner, uh, a World Watch researcher, actually looks at how to deal with the 100 million or more climate migrants that will come as, as, uh, as climate change happens and ends up flooding and, and leading to other, uh, basically, increased movement of populations. But again, turning to the Netherlands for one other example, which I really love, uh, is, is that they've also invested millions of dollars in normalizing shifts in, in diet uh, for the Dutch people. Uh, you might not have figured out what this is, but I think you probably did. Uh, this is a, a, a little container of mealworms that you can now buy in some of the grocery stores in the Netherlands. Uh, and they recognize that meat consumption is both unsustainable, it, it's a major uh, cause of, of methane emissions and, and climate change. Uh, their population is very dense uh, and uh, grain prices as they go up will bring up meat uh, costs as well. So they're trying to be a leader in shifting dietary norms to more sustainable choices. Uh, and bugs also have the benefit of actually liking factory farmed conditions, you know, high populations of bugs, that's okay. And they're much harder to spread diseases from bugs to humans than livestock like cows and, and, and pigs to humans. So th there's a lot of benefits of, of raising bugs for livestock instead of, uh, instead of uh, cows or chickens. Uh, and I find this so interesting because it, it could be a real major trend in, in the future of food. Uh, you know, John suggested that we swap out the, uh, the meat plate today for, with, uh, with uh, mealworms, but uh, I guess, I guess the uh, higher-ups disagreed. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but what's interesting is I really think that there's a real opportunity here, not just in the Netherlands, but uh, even right here, uh, for some of the leaders in the room to, to capitalize on this. Uh, I'd like to introduce the Bug Mac, if you will. I, I know McDonald's is a finalist here today, and I thought, what better way to suggest some pioneering uh, business cultural sustainability uh, changes than the Bug Mac? Uh, if, if we really think about it, no corporation has more power in shaping dietary norms. So if, if, if McDonald's puts its weight behind this, there could be a real uh, excitement there. And it would be a good coping strategy uh, if, if meat prices do skyrocket, which there's a good chance in the future, to start testing this now. Uh, of course, you know, play it off as a, a marketing stunt, a limited time only kind of idea, but it really could uh, get Americans used to the idea of, of bug consumption. And just for a little context, a lot of the world already eats bugs. 20,000 Thai households actually raise bugs uh, for sale locally or for their own consumption. So this is something that most of the world already sees as normal and, and uh, will eventually get there too, I think. But now, I, I want to, you know, I, I, I'm intentionally driving some of these, this conversation to the extremes so that I can make it clear that, I mean, this is the, that was the path that we would, will go, you know, adapting to climate refugees, uh, getting ready for massive increases in temperature, and so on. 
Um, that's the, the topic that we really got into in depth in Say the World 2010, this Transforming Cultures uh, report. Uh, and it's all online for free at uh, transformingcultures.org. So I'll, I'll mention a few chapters that I think you'll especially be interested in, which you can download freely if you'd like. But I think you know, from a business perspective, how do we transform cultures? I mean, the, the business community took such an important role in, in, in helping to, to shift cultures to, to you know, celebrate increased levels of consumption back in the post-World War II uh, environment. And that was really a op great opportunity at that time you know, to, to expand human well-being. We just didn't recognize the ecological costs at that point. But now that we do, there's a lot of opportunities to transform business into a leader towards that sustainable future. Uh, and, and that can be done in many ways. I'm going to kind of go through a few. Uh, Ray Anderson actually paired with an uh, anthropology uh, student to in, with the State of the World 2010 to write a chapter on how the culture of, of interface actually changed uh, after he had his epiphany of, of the importance of sustainability. Uh, and, and it was a really important chapter that um, still holds today. Uh, you know, even after Ray Anderson's death, uh, the, the company of Interface really has prioritized uh, sustainability and, and their mission zero of, of really building a company and uh, a, a product line that had no impact on the environment. And what's interesting is that you know, there's even op opportunities and efforts by businesses to fully redefine the mission, not just to, to no impact, but to truly put even at the top of that, their priorities, not just profit, but actually social, positive social impact. This is a great example, um, one of my favorites, uh, Cabbages and Condoms. It's a restaurant in Thailand that uh, was founded during the HIV crisis in the 80s. So Thailand was one of the worst affected by HIV AIDS and uh, a, a, an entrepreneur who eventually became the, the health minister, actually, because of some of this work, uh, founded a, a little restaurant called Cabbages and Condoms. And, and to be clear, cabbages is one of those staple foods in Thailand uh, that everyone loves. So while Cabbages and Condoms doesn't sound like a good title for uh, a restaurant here in the US, it would be like Burgers and Condoms here. Uh, but but it's, it ended up you know, normalizing and, and breaking the taboo around, around safe sex, around condom use. It became a very popular idea uh, and, and restaurant with the youth. Um, instead of passing out mints, they passed out uh, condoms at the, at, the, at the front desk. They had all this different condom art. They sponsored a Miss Condom pageant. Uh, and, and through those years, they helped to really normalize a a, un, a deeper understanding of, of safe sex and, um, and help to really combat the HIV epidemic. And the most interesting thing is with their profits, which because they were popular, they did uh, make, uh, they ended up using a lot of those profits to uh, expand family planning opportunities in rural areas too. So it was uh, at its very heart uh, a, a social enterprise. And there are other efforts even now to kind of normalize that even in current corporations, the, the B Corporation movement that's going on in the US that's really integrating directly into the legal codes of corporations. Uh, a, a, B, uh, a, benef a B stands for beneficial or benefit corporation, a, a mission, a social mission right at the heart of, of the, the company's legal charter, which also protects it so that if the founder or CEO moves uh, moves on, then the, the legal charter still holds them to a, a benefit mission. What's also interesting is, is both governments and, and businesses have a real opportunity to uh, edit or shape consumers' choices. Uh, you know, the, the bad examples are often, you know, the putting, putting, creating grocery stores where the milk is all the way in the back of the store, so you have to go through many aisles to get there. Uh, and end up having more impulse buys. But the opposite is starting to happen. Uh, this is an image from a local DC grocery store uh, after the story of bottled water came out, Annie Leonard's story of stuff projects, uh, one of the, the videos that talked about the, the, the difficulties ecologically with bottled water. They actually removed all the 
bottled water, non-flavored, non-sparkling, just the basic bottled water from their shelves and put the, the video there. Uh, they recognize that maybe our store shouldn't be selling this when people can get perfectly fine tap water instead. Uh, and there's, you know, and that, that's, there's a cost involved there, but there's a marketing advantage as well. And government can do the same thing. DC uh, added a, a tax on plastic bags uh, three years ago. And within a month, the total bag consumption went from 14 million to 2 million. Uh, and it's stayed stable since then at a much lower level. So there's real opportunity to edit how consumers, uh, what, what they priorities, what, what they choose. Uh, there's even, for the Boulder corporations, opportunity to uh, encourage your customers to buy less. And now I know that sounds counterintuitive. Uh, it's working well for Patagonia, which actually has uh, started a new marketing campaign that actually encourages their customers to not buy products from them unless they really need them. And if they really need them, then they should look on their, on the used at the used spots in there, they have actually shelves in some of their stores selling used Patagonia clothes, and they partnered with eBay to sell uh, used Patagonia clothes as well. So, you know, on the one hand, there's a, a loss there. On the other hand, uh, they're also they're defining themselves through their marketing as a sustainability leader, uh, and also conveying that their clothes are some of the best out there uh, because it's going to last that long where we can actually have it. Um, resell it one day. Uh, a slightly less uh, challenging way to do that is actually encourage your, your customers to buy less of your competitors' products. A more of a strategy of, of Dove, where they're encouraging people to use their soap and, ha and, and just celebrate their skin and their selves uh, without makeup. Right? So trying to really shift the, the beauty norms in, in America uh, to get people to use their soap products and, and stop there rather than covering their faces with makeup. But there's some great strategies to get people to consume less. Uh, and then there's also, of course, I won't even bother with this because I think everyone in the room is familiar, uh, it's an opportunity to sell services rather than goods, whether we're talking about uh, Zipcar or this Capital Bike Share that sells uh, rents bike access instead of uh, actual bike selling bikes, or even interface carpets that actually sells the surface of flooring rather than their carpets, so they end up replacing carpet tiles as they get worn out uh, over the course of your, your lease, and so on. There's lots of ways to innovate on actually just selling what people need rather than the product themselves. Uh, and, and one of my favorite examples, and I just wrote a recent article about this, is the, uh, the strategy of suing your unsustainable competitors. Uh, I'm sure some of you have had uh, personal experiences with lawsuits, mostly on competitive ideas uh, and competitive practices. But there's the, Dr. Bronner's is the first and only example that I've found of actually suing 13 other competitors for falsely using organic in their, in their labeling. Uh, and, and it I just had a good conversation with the, the president of Dr. Bronner's to learn more about it and, and found out that they spent about $1.5 million over the period of, of about five years and eventually won. Um, not in actual, in the lawsuit, but uh, Whole Foods weighed in and they're a big enough company that when they said, okay, you either have to change your labels or change your ingredients to those 13 competitors, uh, everyone did because they still wanted their products sold in Whole Foods. So uh, they, with a very small investment, they were able to strengthen their niche as a sustainability leader, uh, draw negative attention to their competitors, uh, increase access to actual, truly organic products for consumers, uh, and raise the prices or shrink the niches of their competitors. So ignoring the ecological benefits, that's just a smart strategy. But then you add all the ecological benefits of, of this with you know, increased uh, consumer awareness of, of actu actual organic products and raise, increasing demand for those organic ingredients. There's a real opportunity there. And, and for, the, for the government leaders, I think I really want to draw attention to this point. Um, 
because I, I recognize that often companies are under a lot of pressure in the short term to focus on short term. And governance has a lot of opportunity, government, to nudge corporations in the right direction. Uh, and having uh, the right tax incentives pushing, uh, you know, shaping the, the playing field, whether we're talking about carbon, whether we're talking about junk food or disposable par products. You know, imagine if, uh, if the cost of, of plastic, the taxes on plastic was different depending on what its use was for. This is actually a policy proposed back in 1972, unfortunately didn't catch on, uh, but you know, a plastic disposable one-time use cup might be taxed at a 200% rate, while plastic used for the back of a computer might be, have a very small tax on it. Right? Because that, that is what plastic should be using for, being used for, rather than this kind of disposable lifestyle. Uh, and advertising is, is also another important one where uh, you know, this unfortunately often encourages overconsumption and you know, curbing some of the advertising would, um, you know, would be a real opportunity in uh, shifting us towards the sustainable path. path. Uh, and also, of course, all that tax revenue could be used to get us ready and to sustain high levels of well-being even in a degrowth economy. Right, right now, most consumers are spending more on book purchases or uh, cars, in part because they don't have good access to public libraries or public transportation. But strengthening public transportation, strengthening public water systems so that there are, once again, fountains regularly accessible rather than having to buy bottled water, um, increasing what libraries offer, from not just books to tools to toys, uh, I have a 16-month-old, and I would love if I could borrow toys from the library uh, rather than buying them. Uh, and there's real opportunities there. Even really innovative things like this image in the, in the middle right is a picture of a library kiosk in the Madrid uh, metro system. So imagine if on your, your commute, when you have 10-minute wait for the next train, you could go in and pick up a book that you ordered at the library a few days ago, and it's just right there waiting for you to be picked up. Uh, you know, there's a real opportunity to, to create micro libraries right there where people already are in the first place. Uh, all of this, of course, takes money, but all of that could be coming from, from tax revenues that are shaping uh, the, the economic playing field into a direction that brings us to a truly sustainable society rather than uh, waiting for Earth to push us there in a much less comfortable way. So I recognize that I'm putting a lot out there, and, and I did that on purpose because I think you all can handle it. I don't want to sugarcoat the future. I don't want to do anything like that. I want to make it clear that you all in this room with your power, I'm not going to hide that. You all are in, you know, in very powerful institutions and have the opportunity to play an important role as cultural pioneer in shaping us, bringing us to this sustainable future. And that's what we'll need. We'll need those institutions from the media and government and business, education, to really drive us towards the sustainable future uh, rather than waiting for uh, the ecological systems to really drive us towards a much less happy path. But with that energy and with that recognition and with that kind of commitment, there, there is that sustainable future really much still attainable. So I thank you very much, and uh, congratulations again in, in all the awards you've won today.